So now getting into the class itself, the recipe itself, I like to start off with a little bit of information about who I am and Todo Verde, especially if you're new to these classes. My name is Jocelyn Ramirez and I'm the chef and founder of Todo Verde here in Los Angeles. I started back in 2015 and it's definitely evolved. Now we're all online and that's great. Um, prior to being in these online cooking classes, we were mostly a catering company trying to open up brick and mortar restaurants throughout the east side of Los Angeles. And COVID kind of derailed that for the time being. So now we're here safely in our own homes cooking. I did also publish this cookbook. If you haven't picked it up yet, it's called La Vida Verde. It was published in April of last year and it has 60 plant-based recipes. We are gonna be making the chorizo from the book uh, that's gonna to top our enfrijoladas. However, the enfrijoladas are not a part of the, um, are not a recipe featured in the book. So I'm kind of piecing some things together. And if you do have the book, I'm gonna be working off of page 75 and that's the chorizo recipe. However, I am uh, reducing the amount instead of making the full amount of chorizo and the pickled onions, we are going to be making half of that recipe just because we don't need a ton. The main focus here is going to be the enfrijoladas and then the chorizo and the pickled onion are just um, accents to the enfrijoladas. So let's get into it. We're going to start with the element of the recipe that is maybe not the most important, but I just want to have make sure that it has time to sit and kind of marry together and it's the pickled onion. So what I already did, like I said, I have some things missed out and we have, we're making three things today. We're making the pickled red onion, we're making the chorizo, and then of course we're making the, the frijoles for our frijoladas, the sauce essentially. Um, and so I've already kind of gotten a head start and I've thinly sliced half of a red onion um, it doesn't have to be perfect. Once this um, kind of melds into the acids, which are the lemon juice, the white vinegar, the apple cider vinegar, it's gonna break down. And I would say give it at least 30 minutes before you eat it. Uh, sometimes when I'm rushing, cause this is something I like to make when I make mole. And sometimes when I'm rushing, what I'll do is um, I'll put it on a, like a low flame burner, like not enough, to, I don't wanna cook it per se, but I wanna heat it and the heat will penetrate uh, or act um, so that the lemon will penetrate the onion a whole lot faster. Back in the day when I used to have a microwave, I haven't had a microwave in years, but back in the day when I did, I used to pop the bowl of onions, pickled onions in the microwave for like 30 seconds and that would do the trick too. So half of a red onion, this was a really large one. So it's kind of a lot, but it's all good. And then I also thinly sliced a uh, half of a lemon. And this is just a Meyer lemon off of my tree in the backyard. So you wanna have it all in a bowl. You wanna just use your hands to just uh, create some separations of all the, um, the layers of the onion, just so that you can really get all of that acid, that lemon juice, the vinegars, into the onion really well. Otherwise it's gonna take a little bit longer. So you just wanna kind of make sure that it's all in these individualized pieces as much as possible. You're gonna have delicious smelling hands. Yeah, right, just kidding. The, so I always mention this in my classes when people are like, oh, this recipe doesn't have onion or garlic in it. It's not, um, onion and garlic are not ingredients I use heavily in a lot of my recipes. However, I do have a sweet spot in my heart for pickled onions, um, especially when there's very um, heavy on the citrus on the lemon juice. So this is something that's typically just kind of hanging out in my fridge and this will last in your fridge for about a good, um, maybe like two weeks or so. I, the, the ones that I have in my fridge right now, which is pretty much ending, honestly, I might've had it in my fridge for about a month now. Um, it's so vinegar and acid heavy that it, it does last. And this will be better tomorrow than it is gonna be even in the 30 minutes of it hanging out. So I just mixed in my uh, lemon slices with my onion. And then I'm going to add my acid, my spices and a generous amount of salt. So for the spices, I like to add 
um, obviously salt and pepper are pretty straightforward, right? For most dishes. I'm also adding here something like a bay leaf and the bay leaf again, like the more time it has to sit, like bay leaves have obviously like they provide a, a good like uh, depth of flavor to dishes, but they're also a tiny bit sweet. And I like that little bit of sweetness in there. I also do have a half teaspoon of crushed red pepper flakes just to give a little bit of chilito, a little spiciness to it. Uh, a quarter teaspoon, sorry, that was a quarter teaspoon of chili flakes, a quarter teaspoon of dried oregano, a pinch of pepper. That's all gonna get sprinkled in there. And you can obviously be a little bit more heavy handed with any of those elements that you really love. I'm going to put in here my acids. So I have here a quarter cup of lemon juice. This is freshly squeezed lemon juice. You could use bottled or pre-juiced if you have that available and it's the refrigerated kind. That always is, works out fine for these types of dishes. And then I have an eighth of a cup of apple cider vinegar, an eighth of a cup of, sorry, a quarter cup of white vinegar. So it's a touch of apple cider vinegar and more of the white vinegar. I love the, the, the flavor of the apple cider. However, it could overpower in the, in the, uh, the lemon juice. So I want it to be more um, lemon focused. So I'm gonna go ahead and just pour that into my bowl of onions or onion slices. And then I have here some salt. The recipe calls for half a tablespoon of salt. So I'll go ahead and eyeball about half a tablespoon of salt. You can use a measuring spoon if you need to. Honestly, for me, sometimes the more salt, the merrier. This is a garnish. It's not like you're eating a whole bowl of this. And so it adds like a nice acid crunch, salty kick to the dish. I'm gonna grab my tongs. And I'm just going to kind of just try to macerate the onions a little bit. Try to get that bay leaf down to the bottom so it really infuses in that acid and it gives it a nice, great flavor. So I'm just kind of like, all right, onions, do your thing. Here's a little massage, getting all those spices well incorporated. And we'll come back to this later and you'll notice that the, um, especially the, the pieces of onion that are in the acid are going to reduce and they're also going to release their juices. So you'll start to see it kind of go down in the bowl. And then we want to mix it again and make sure all these pieces on the surface get worked into the, um, the liquid on the bottom and just let it hang out. So we're going to go ahead and set this aside. It's a really, really simple, easy recipe. You just want it to hang out. And, and obviously like right now, you can still see the differentiation of the color, like the purple or the red um, exterior of the onion and then the white interior. Uh, but as this sits, especially if you pick it out of the fridge tomorrow, you're gonna notice that they're gonna be this really beautiful pink color, which is what you saw in the photograph for this class. So that's gonna be even better tomorrow. All right, so let's get into the other elements of this dish. So any questions on the onions? Let me get these out of the way. Everyone's okay? Oh, and my dog's upset about the mailman being here. So sorry if she barks, no barking. Okay, <laughs> so let's get into the other elements. We're going to do a little bit of uh, toasting of chiles and some spices for our chorizo. So let me talk a little bit about the chiles and then I'll get into the spices. I'm gonna preheat a stainless steel pan that I have here on the front burner of my stove. I'm just gonna preheat to like a medium, medium low. I don't need it to be scorching hot. I just need it, especially because um, I'm gonna cook the chiles first and it'll get pretty hot in here. And then I'm gonna let it sit at a really low temperature, even turn off the heat before I throw in the other spices because if you throw it in right after, it's gonna smoke on you, it's gonna burn. So you wanna give it a little bit of a pause to cool down and then put in the other elements. So the chiles that we're using here for the chorizo are typical flavors for any chorizo, whether it's a, a meat chorizo or not. So I have here two guajillo chiles and guajillos are one of my favorite chiles. I use them in a ton of recipes 
and you can see that they're pretty long, narrow. They have a, a mild spiciness to them. I would say that uh, the smaller the Wajillo Chile, the more the more spicy it will be typically is what I find because the seeds where the capsaicin is, is closer to the skin of the Chile. And then I also do have here a Chile ancho, which is called ancho because ancho means wide, right? And so this chile is a bit um, wider and more wrinkly. The texture reminds me of kind of like a, a raisin almost. And it actually, the flavor also does slightly remind me of a slightly spicy raisin. So when it comes to heat levels, the ancho is definitely less spicy than the guajillos. The guajillos pack a little bit more of a punch. However, they're not spicy at all. This is something that, you know, I think even kids would be okay with eating. Now getting into the next chile, which kind of fell apart on me here, broken half, but uh, is the chile de arbol. Now the chile de arbol is definitely the one that's gonna bring the heat to this equation. Um, chile de arbol is, is a pretty spicy um, uh, chile and it will toast a lot faster than these other chiles. So I have that stainless steel pan that's preheating. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna toast them until they start to um, become a bit more fragrant until they release some of the oil that the chiles naturally have within them. And also that I start to see a little bit of coloration. Um, I wanna see a slight blackening, um, but not burnt, right? I don't want the whole chile to burn to a crisp. I just wanna start to see almost as if you're like grilling or searing something, a little bit of color on there. And it's just a dry skillet, there's no oil. Um, and then what I do have near my stove on standby is a bowl of warm water. So you want to have that ready to go so that once these chiles are essentially reawakened, you know, the heat is going to re reawaken the flavors, you have that bowl of water ready to rehydrate them. So let's go ahead and head over to the stove. It should be nice and hot now. It is. I can feel with my hand the heat coming through. And we're just going to drop those chiles in. And it should take a couple minutes. You just wanna, um, you just wanna keep turning them, checking. Like I said, the chile de arbol is gonna cook a little bit faster than the other chiles because it's smaller and it just it just always cooks so much faster. And you wanna get it to the point where they're fragrant, maybe not so much smoky, uh, because if you <laughs> um, burn them, then you're definitely gonna get a high smoke point. And one thing I will notice is like, or note is with the chile de arbol, if you're toasting a bunch of these, um, they do provide like quite a bit of smoke and it, it's the smoke that'll like make you cough. It's gonna be a spicy smoke that your body's gonna be like, what is that? I wasn't ready for this. So I'm just keeping an eye on it. This is something you absolutely have to babysit. Don't walk away from your stove when you're doing this. Hang out there. And it's going to happen in just a couple minutes. You can already see some of that blackening there that's happening with my chile de arbol. You can see there, hopefully. And so that's what I'm looking for. I can definitely start to smell some of the fragrance of the chiles. I'm just going to cook the chile de arbol for maybe like another 30 seconds and then I'll remove it. Any questions so far as we're getting cooking here. I could see some of the blackening happening here on my chile guajillo there. So I'm looking for that coloration. It's a little bit harder to see, I'll be honest with you, with the chile ancho because the chile itself is pretty dark. Let me take that chile de arbol out. I'm just dropping it into a big old, big old bowl of water, bigger than like is necessary for these amount of chiles, but just getting that ready. You could see the um, coloration change a little bit more when you pan fry chile ancho because they bubble and you can see the browning and it sears a little bit more. But uh, for this recipe, we are just going, going to dry toast. So I went ahead and turned off the heat because I want my pan to cool down for the next round of spices here. And I'll talk about those as this continues to cool down. And I'm gonna go ahead and remove my chiles. So if you see here, hopefully you can see in this light, 
but I do have a little bit more of this darker color that came through. So this is the Chile Wajio color here. And then it got a little bit darker here with the, um, with the toasting. You can see that here as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove these. They're nice and fragrant, but they're not smoky. They're not burnt. And they're gonna be so much more flavorful for this dish. So I'm just gonna go ahead and throw those in the water. And then the other thing you wanna do is make sure that they're fully submerged in the water. If you find that yours are floating on the top a lot, what you could do is just place another bowl or something heavy over the top so that they stay submerged. I have enough water in here, so I, I'm gonna be fine. Um, but if you wanna make sure yours are fully submerged, just place something else on top. I'm going to just remove the seeds in here of the chiles, there was a few seeds in there. I did de-seed as much as I could and I removed the stem of each of the chiles, but there's always a few in there. So I'm just taking that out because those will likely burn if I try to continue to cook those with the spices I have going. So let's talk a little bit about the spices in here. Again, typical spices that we see for chorizo. And um, let me just go through and make sure that I'm looking at my list so that I don't forget the amounts. So I have here, starting off with the oregano, I have half a tablespoon of dried oregano that are, is gonna give like this nice earthy balance to the dish and a nice kick of, um, I mean, I guess the word that I'm thinking of is earthiness, but I, I love the flavor, the scent, all of, all of the above with oregano. I have a tablespoon of paprika and that paprika is gonna, um, give a little bit of smokiness. It's smoked paprika and it's also going to help with the color. Um, so that color is going to permeate throughout the dish. And then I have here somewhere hidden is a clove. So you can use one to two cloves in the dish. So I have one clove that I'm going to be using. You can absolutely use two if you really love clove. I do like clove. I'm not a huge fan of like clove overpowering. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm going to choose the one if I had to choose between one and two. And I have here a half teaspoon of cumin here, which is going to provide a little bit of, uh, like this grounding, um, kind of, uh, uh, grounding flavor profile for the dish. I have a quarter of a teaspoon of coriander, which is here, another very grounding spice. I have a quarter teaspoon of Mexican cinnamon here. And this is gonna um, play really well with the clove. So that's gonna give it this nice sort of, um, not spicy, like hot spicy capsaicin, but this nice kind of um, balance of spices in the dish. And I can repeat these amounts if you need me to. So I'm gonna go ahead and start toasting these up. Again, this was, half tablespoon dried oregano, one tablespoon paprika, one clove, one to two clove, your choice, a half teaspoon of cumin, this is just ground cumin, a quarter teaspoon of coriander, and a quarter teaspoon of Mexican cinnamon. So at this point, I think that my uh, spices, sorry, my um, stainless steel pan is probably at a great temperature right now for me to be able to toast that. Other ingredient that I didn't mention here is I just threw in the uh, pinch of freshly cracked black pepper because that's gonna be nice to toast in there as well. So I just wanna make sure that my pan is not burning hot. Right now it still feels pretty warm. Like if I were to set my hand on there, I would definitely burn myself. So I'm just gonna put it on pretty low. I just want to warm the spices through. This might happen really quickly. Let me grab my spatula here just so that I can, quickly remove the spices and keep them moving. And again, another thing, you wanna babysit. You don't wanna walk away from this. I could already see a little bit of smoking happening there. So it's going to amplify all of the flavors in here. Again, oils will be released from these spices and it's going to make them so much more delicious and awake for this dish rather than just throwing them in as is. Jocelyn, could you explain to us the difference between Mexican oregano and Italian and the difference between Mexican cinnamon and regular cinnamon? That's a great question. So the difference between Mexican oregano and uh, Italian oregano 
is mostly, well, I, there is a slight flavor difference, but um, the biggest difference is definitely the size of the leaves themselves. So I grow Mexican oregano. My plant is actually doing not that great. I transferred it from my garden to home and it's like, it's like super sad about it. Um, but Mexican oregano definitely has more of, um, I would say a stronger flavor profile than the Italian oregano. Um, and then the leaves are way bigger. They're probably like five times the size of the typical dried oregano that you find at your grocery store. And then the, um, and it's very hard to find Mexican oregano at the grocery store. You likely have to go to um, uh, either a Mexican grocery store or to somebody who specifically works with spices um, and, and ask for that specific spice. Um, so it's not as common as the Italian. And then the difference between the Mexican cinnamon, which is called a Ceylon cinnamon, I'm just gonna remove these spices and put them back into the very same bowl that I had them in, just to get them out of this hot pan. I don't want them to burn. And then I'm gonna start getting things into my blender. I forgot to mention that the chiles, I do want those chiles to soak for at least a good 10 minutes. That's warm water and that's gonna help rehydrate them so that they're ready to go in the blender. So talking about the cinnamon really quick. So there's Ceylon cinnamon and the other one I believe is called Cassia cinnamon. They're both from um, uh, you know, the Vietnam area. Um, that's where they originate from. Um, the, the main differences, there are definitely differences in the flavor profile. Um, ones that I definitely notice, like I can eat something and say, oh, I know which type of cinnamon was used in this recipe, even if it's a small amount. So the Mexican cinnamon is really flaky. You can break it apart really easily. Um, and the flavor is, um, for lack of a better word, like kind of like a sweet spicy. Um, and then the cassia cinnamon is more of the type of cinnamon that you would taste in an apple pie. Um, and, and that cinnamon stick is hard as a rock. Like if you try to break that with your hands, it's impossible. You can't do it. You might need to use like a hammer or something like that. So like the textures are different. It's like a different type of tree bark. Um, in fact, cinnamon is the only tree bark that's uh, edible for humans is what I've read before. So I think that that's a, kind of an interesting little fact there. Um, but yeah, the, the slight variations of flavor are different. I prefer Ceylon cinnamon. That's what I grew up eating. I'm not the biggest fan of like cinnamon buns, apple pie that uses cassia cinnamon. Like it's just a different flavor. Okay, so we are going to, in a moment, blend up those ingredients that we just uh, started to pan fry, or sorry, started to toast. We didn't pan fry them. Um, but before we do that, because I just want to give my chiles just a couple more minutes to rehydrate before we get into the blending process, is I want to just talk about the main ingredients that are going to provide the texture components for our chorizo. So, I have here three bowls and the first one is tempeh. I should have these two together because these are going to cook together. So I have tempeh, which is essentially uh, fermented soybeans, very different texture than you would have in a tofu um, where this is more crumbly. Um, it also takes on any flavor that you put on it essentially. Um, and it's, it's the whole soybeans together and you can buy it with a bunch of other things in it with flax, with rice, with um, so many other ingredients. And the other element that we have here, so this is a, this is a half of a, of a block of tempeh, which is about a half a cup of tempeh that I'm going to crumble up and mince up slightly. And then I also do have four ounces of cremini mushrooms. You can use shiitakes. Um, I like to use either of those variations because I find that they're a little bit more flavorful than your typical white button mushrooms. Um, and the shiitakes will have a little bit less of that liquid component to them. So I like those as, just as much as I like the creminis in this recipe. I am gonna mince these up in my tiny, super teeny tiny, very cute food processor, um, just so you can see the texture that I'm looking for here. And then the other star ingredient is going to be my tofu. So I have extra firm tofu, and I have about a cup of it here. I'm gonna crumble this up and we're going to get these elements ready 
for the rest of our chorizo. So let me go ahead and get started with that paste that we're gonna make with the, the pretty much the spices and all the flavor, everything that's gonna flavor the chorizo. Let's blend that up. And then we're gonna get these other ingredients going and then we'll go ahead and start cooking. So I'm gonna grab my Vitamix blender. If you don't have a Vitamix blender or a high power blender, I shouldn't say specifically Vitamix, but if you don't have a high power blender, you may need to, excuse me, that the little bit of smoke from the chiles. You may need to pass your paste through a fine mesh um, just so that you can grab any little bits of chile that might not have broken down. All right. So what you're looking for in your chiles that have rehydrated is definitely a little bit of uh, pliability. They should be pretty soft and easy to maneuver. Um, earlier, they may have been a little bit stiff. And so you want to, these actually need maybe like another minute or two, specifically the ancho. So I'm not gonna get, blend it just yet because it's gonna call for more liquid. I want that liquid to be infused. So let me take a pause from this. Let's do the tofu, the mushrooms. I'm trying to go back and forth to keep us on track with time, but I also want to make sure that I give my ingredients enough time to do what they're supposed to do. So the mushrooms, the tempeh and the tofu, we're gonna come back to it. So all I'm gonna do for my mushrooms, because I have the tiniest food processor, I'm just going to uh, feed this through my food processor to break them down. You can absolutely use a knife and just mince these up with your knife if you'd like. I prefer to use a food processor because I feel like the texture is gonna be so much more like a chorizo. When I um, chop them, if you have the patience to chop them and mince them pretty finely, um, then you'll be able to get a nice texture. Otherwise, you might have some chunks that are a little bit too big. So I like to just throw those in a food processor. I'll do it in two batches, maybe three, because this food processor is teeny tiny. I used to live in a really small apartment and uh, didn't have a lot of counter space. And so I didn't want, or uh, cabinet space, so I didn't want this food, food processor. There we go. Oh, and a bunch got stuck right here, what I didn't see. There we go. So just moving that around. But again, you can absolutely do this by hand if you need to. few little mushroom nubs that didn't want to break down and I can just break those down with my hands. So I just have a bowl here. I'm just going to use my hands to get that broken down mushroom out of there and you can see the texture here. It's a little bit moist because again herminis are going to be more moist than your shiitakes are if you're using shiitakes. And I'll go ahead and blitz up the next batch here. Let me actually do it in two. It'll probably be a little bit faster. Any questions as I'm blending here? Now you may be wondering, why are we using, you know, three different elements? Like you typically see at the grocery store, soy riso, right? Like a soy based chorizo. And you can absolutely, you know, make this with just a uh, soy base. However, you know, if you use tofu as your main element, I find that it's a little bit too mushy. It's a little bit too, um, even if you use extra firm tofu, it's still, um, you know, unless you get like a, there's a brand called Hodo um, and their, actu their extra firm tofu is actually firm. It's really firm. I actually really love that, that brand. Um, but most other ones, even the one I'm using today is like not that firm. Oh, 
of course you could also use maybe not tofu like you could use another soy element such as um you know textured soy protein or the you know tex textured vegetable protein tvp you could use something like that and rehydrate it and add all the elements you know to flavor a chorizo um but i really love mushrooms in fact you know if you have been in my classes before i probably praise mushrooms a little bit too much but i just find that they give such a really nice depth of flavor to a lot of dishes and it just is something that i would want to include you know minced up in a dish like this so that it's even more flavorful and delicious with that mushroom element it just gives it a nice meaty sort of texture and flavor i'm just going to break down any other large bits. Actually, I might do this with my food processor one last time for these big pieces and break that down. And then I think I am good to go with these mushrooms. And then for your tempeh, you just, you could hand crumble or you can also mince with a knife. Or of course you can also add it to your food processor. All right, so that is now broken down. There we go. Scraping everything out. You can use a spatula. I'm just going in with my hand here. All right, and then for the tempeh, like I said, you can crumble. I kind of like the crumbles because it provides that little texture component that I think is important for chorizo. Um, you know, Mexican chorizo, it's obviously very different than Spanish chorizo, which is where it originated because we didn't have pork in, um, in here in this country prior to colonization. Um, but obviously Spanish chorizo is not crumbly. It's actually a pretty firm sausage that you can slice um, and is, is typically dry aged. But then here you have in Mexico, this chorizo that is super crumbly, it's like our version of bacon that we use for lots of breakfast dishes and even for tacos like papas con chorizo is a very popular taco recipe so i like to play on the texture point here of this like slightly crumbly element of the chorizo if you feel like you can taste the tempeh a little bit too much because you still have you know, these uh, soybeans that are like halved or they're already kind of broken down. Um, you can absolutely throw that in the food processor and break it down further so that you don't, so that you get more of the seasoning, the flavor to coat your, um, your elements without them kind of overpowering the dish. So I am going to turn on my back burner here. And I'm going to add some oil to my cast iron skillet that's back there. And what I wanna do is essentially, I wanna start cooking this until I start to see some browning, some crispiness. I'm gonna add some salt, some pepper to it. And I'm also gonna add a little dash of mushroom powder here. I have a half teaspoon of mushroom powder. I like to have porcini mushroom powder on hand. I really love the flavor of porcini mushrooms. And it's just another uh, flavor element that is gonna enhance the dish. You can add more mushroom powder if you wanted to but a little goes a long way. I'm just gonna sprinkle that in there before I throw it into that preheating skillet back there. Any questions on this so far? And for the oil, I also have, uh, excuse me, there we go. I have a, a quarter cup of oil that I'm gonna be using to sear this up and to give it a nice amount of color. So I'm gonna drop in a little bit of that oil here. I need some of the oil. So I'm gonna use like about an eighth of a cup for the tempeh mushroom mixture. And then I'll need about another eighth of a cup to sear up my tofu mixture. So let me go ahead and throw that in. Let me season it with a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. And I'm gonna throw that into this preheating skillet on my stove. Let me grab my spatula. 
and I'm just going to drop that in. I can hear the sizzling. And essentially this browning, this crispiness is going to add an element of flavor. I'm not going to add in the uh, tofu just yet. I'm going to wait a little bit until my chili mixture is complete. And then also, awesome. would you mind shifting the camera a little bit towards the, of course, there we go. There we go. So we have our tempeh chorizo mixture that's browning up here. It'll take a few minutes. You can step away for a few minutes, come back to it. You don't have to babysit this as much as we were doing with the chile and the spices. In a few minutes, I'll taste it for salt. Go ahead. Is that a medium heat? Yeah, I have it on about medium heat. And just have it spread out so that you can get a nice even coloring that's happening here as we're browning these ingredients. So I'm on a medium heat in a cast iron skillet. I love using cast iron in my kitchen. I love using stainless steel. And could you let us so, know what part of the grocery store you would find mushroom powder in? Sure. So for mushroom powder, I typically find that at either an Asian, Asian grocery store online or um, a specialty store. Like uh, this porcini powder I actually get at a, it's a chef store, but it's open to the public. It's called Surface here in Los Angeles. And I buy a ton of things from them. I also buy, uh, they have a package of dried mushrooms. It's a variety of different mushrooms. And I actually threw in a few of these into the beans that I cooked to make them frijoladas to give it another element of flavor. So you can get it at that specialty store. I believe they also ship. So if you wanted to purchase from their website and get it shipped to you, you can absolutely do that. So let's transition as that's browning to just one more thing that I wanna do here. Since we're here, we're gonna to transition to our tofu. All I'm gonna do is just crumble it up. I just wanna crumble it up. I drained out the liquid that it was hanging out in. I used some sturdy paper towels to squeeze and pat dry and remove as much of the liquid as possible. And I'm just using my fingers to really break this down and get it to this nice little small texture, this small crumble, it's gonna work really well in our chorizo. Let me pan down just a little bit more. There we go. All right, so that is good to go. I'm gonna set it aside as we get our chile mixture ready. So just hand crumble that until it's that nice texture. And I'll bring it up here so you can see. You wanna to get to that small crumbly texture. So I'm gonna give my hands a rinse and let's get that chile going. All right. So into my blender. Now let's check on these chiles so you can see what I'm looking for here. So you can see here, now my chile ancho is pretty soft to the touch, pliable. The longer you let them soak, the even more pliable they'll be. In fact, they'll be really easy to tear and they might break apart even as you're trying to pull them out of the water. And you will also see that the skin of the chile will thicken up because it's rehydrating. So we're gonna throw those chiles into our blender. And then we're also gonna pull a quarter cup of this rehydrating liquid because this liquid is now flavored very deliciously with this chile. And so I have a quarter cup measure here. I'm just gonna pull a quarter cup of my rehydrating liquid into my blender. And I might need more, so I'm not gonna toss this just yet. If I find that I need a little bit more loosening to happen, to happen in my chorizo mixture, this, the, the paste essentially that's flavoring this chorizo, I'll pull from there. Sometimes it varies because maybe your chiles are a little bit larger, maybe your chiles are smaller, maybe you know there's, there's different variants in there. And so 
you might need to loosen it up ever so slightly. I'm gonna throw in all the spices that we toasted earlier, just dry toasted to reawaken all those spices. It's the clove, the cinnamon, the, uh, the paprika, all the elements that we threw in there. And then I also do have another couple uh, liquid components. Sorry, this is like not in a clear glass. I didn't have another clear glass, but I do have here, and it just looks dark, is a little bit of liquid aminos and a little bit of apple cider vinegar. So I have a half tablespoon of each one of those elements. And the liquid aminos is definitely an ingredient that I use quite a bit because it's an umami flavor. Uh, if you don't have liquid aminos, you can absolutely use soy sauce and that will definitely give that flavor to your dish. And then the apple cider vinegar is going to give it a little pop. So we'll throw that in there. I'm going to season this with a little bit of salt because you want to salt as you go. And then we'll blend this up until it's a paste. And if I'm having trouble, it's struggling, it doesn't want to break down, I will add more of my liquid to it. So let me go ahead and get that process started. Let me check on my tempeh and mushroom mixture. All right, so a couple things I'm gonna do. You're looking at the stove right now. I'm gonna add another drizzle of oil. because so I see a little bit of my um, mushrooms slightly sticking to the bottom of the pan. And also it just looks a bit dry. So I wanted to just add a touch more oil to make sure I'm still getting that sizzling and browning. I'll mix that in and spread it out once again. So I'm seeing a little bit of that browning happening. I'll let that keep working. And then I'm going to check on my chile mixture. I'm pretty sure I need a little bit more liquid. First of all, this is a small amount. So my blender in itself was already kind of struggling. And I can see, let's see if I can show you that my chiles are kind of bl blitzed up, but they're not smooth. It's not a smooth pace yet. It's definitely a chunky consistency. So I need to add more of my liquid until I get it's not gonna be a super smooth liquidy um, sauce. It's gonna definitely be thick, kind of stick to your ribs, stick to the back of a spoon type of, of paste, but you definitely don't want it to be chunky like this. You wanna make sure you break down your chivas and other elements. I added about another eighth of a cup Let me check on this again. And I can see it's getting so much better. I'm just gonna add another touch of liquid, maybe like a tablespoon of liquid and let that work in. And then I should be good to go. It's also really hard because I have a big old Vitamix blender and it's such a small amount of Paste that my blender is struggling.
Okay. Here we go. So let me grab my spatula. Let's grab another one here and show you what this is looking like. So you can see here, it's definitely a paste. Hopefully I don't spill this on my laptop. It has a little bit of texture to it, but there's no huge pieces of chile in there. Of course, you can blend this until it's a bit more smooth. My blender is definitely struggling a little bit, but I am good with this consistency. Actually here, it's pretty smooth. It just has a bit of that texture just because it's thick. It's a thick paste. So I'm going to add half of this mixture to my bowl of tofu, and I'm going to add the other half of this mixture to my cooking mushroom and tempeh mixture. I'm also going to just give it a little taste for salt and add more salt if I need it. I'm just scraping everything out because I want every little last bit of this mixture into my dish. And get rid of this. Let me give it a little taste on the back of my hand. And it should taste like, yeah, it definitely is good on salt. It should taste like chorizo in a nutshell, right? Like a really um, sort of a, um, punching your face flavor of chorizo. So I'm going to add, like I said, half and half to my tofu bowl. Let me bring that forward. So I'm just gonna add some here to coat that. And then I'm gonna add the rest of it to that pan in the back burner on my stove. I'm also gonna turn on my front burner because I'm gonna cook the tofu in the stainless steel pan that I used earlier to toast uh, or kind of reawaken the spices. And the reason I'm using two pans is just because I wanna make sure that I get a nice bit of crispiness and don't overflow my pan with too much uh, of the ingredients in here because what happens is sometimes the mushroom mixture will start to release too much liquid. So it's almost like sauteing versus searing and crisping up. And I really want this to get nice and brown and crispy. And you can see that it has gotten nice and brown and crispy. So you're definitely looking for that browning to happen. You can see some of that here. And let me put in my chile mixture and start getting that cooking. So I just wanna get that worked in. I wanna get every little last bit of this chile mixture. There we go. I'm gonna add just a little bit more to my tofu. All right, and let's get that tofu cooking. So I'm going to just mix the chile and the tofu mixture together. So it was half of the paste went into the tofu, half of it went into the mushroom tempeh mixture. I'm going to coat my stainless steel pan with a little bit of oil so that I can cook this tofu mixture in there. You can check that out. Drink a little bit of water. All right, so a little drizzle of oil here. This is about an eighth of a cup. Spread that out. And let me go ahead and drop in my tofu mixture. Seeing a little bit of sizzling happening. And I have something in my throat. Hold on one. Does anyone have any questions so far? Is 
what's going on in the kitchen looking good. I saw Mary, you had a really good looking paste earlier. Yeah, I, it, the texture came out really good. Mine tastes a little bit bitter. Do you think that that means I maybe burned the chili? Mm, that's a good question. Jocelyn, Mary wants to know if her paste tastes a little bit bitter, does that indicate that she might have burned the chili? Can you go ahead and ask that again? I didn't hear it. Yeah, no problem. If the paste is tasting a little bit bitter, would that indicate that the chili got a little bit too blackened? Yeah, so that is one indication of chiles getting burned is they do get bitter in that process. So you have to be careful to just get that little bit of blackening to happen, but you don't want to overdo it to where they, they burn. Like I was saying earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, I have like a frog in my throat. Something just like tickled the back of my throat. So sorry if I start needing to drink water, coughing slightly. Um, so if that does happen, I would say that you may need to redo the sauce if it feels extremely bitter. Otherwise, um, if it feels like it's, it's edible and it's still gonna taste good for you, then you can move forward with it. But it's, once you burn something like that, like the chiles, it's kind of hard to get that flavor out of the dish. Any other questions so far? So right now I have my tofu, my mushrooms, all of it's cooking in that chile flavor of the chorizo. I'm gonna combine it shortly. Once I see my tofu starting to get a little bit of that crispiness, I wouldn't say crispiness, but I would say searing because tofu is never gonna be super crispy unless you deep fry it or unless you just sear it in oil, right? Um, like in slices or something like that you'll see maybe a little bit of that chewing happening here. And then we will go ahead and combine the two elements together. I have my mushroom and tempeh mixture actually on low heat right now. I feel like it's at a good point. I've added that half mixture of the chile and it has like a good amount of that flavor coming through. Um, the more that you cook it, the more that you'll get like sort of that darker color coming through of the mushroom and tempeh mixture with mixed with the chile. So I don't want to overdo it. I have it on low heat. And then I'm just going to cook my tofu just a few more minutes here in this front pan before I combine them together. Now, <clears throat> once we have those elements going and we give it a taste for salt and make sure we're all good there, we're going to get right into our mixture for the frijoles, for the frijoladas, which is honestly super simple. If you have never made enfrijoladas before, like blending the beans with the chile, with the flavor components and making the actual enfrijoladas themselves, it pulls together really fast. So we're going to start to get that ready to go, especially for folks who are cooking along. Let me go ahead and remove some of these dishes out of the way and get my station ready. And Jocelyn, what do you say, is it better to underdo the chiles rather than risk burning them? Yeah, I mean, if I again think that you're going to be lacking a little bit of that flavor from toasting the chiles if you don't do that, um, or if you just barely do it. But again, all you're looking for is just for that that flavor to be released in the chile. You just want to start to smell and, and sense that, okay, this this element is like, you know, starting to become more potent almost that toasting process, that's all you want. You don't need a, you don't need to see like a huge color change happening. Okay. <clears throat> I can see some of the searing happening. You might be able to see here on my pan, this piece that I just flipped here has like a little bit of that browning that happened. That's what I'm looking for. Again, just giving this a couple more minutes, maybe just about another minute or so before I combine it with my tofu mixture. Now, as that's going for this next minute, I wanna talk a little bit about the beans that I prepared. I'm gonna pull them forward. I still have them in the pot and I actually used an Instapot to cook the beans. I absolutely love an Instapot for this purpose if you, if you don't have one. Um, 
if you don't, you know that beans take a really long time to cook. You typically have to soak them the night before and then get them, drain out that liquid, put a new liquid for folks who like to do that. Some people swear by leaving the soaking liquid in. Um, I've heard from me Nosrat, which is another chef, say that a lot of people fear that the soaking liquid is where all the farts live. And so that's why people like to drain and put in new liquid. Um, so you want to uh, then cook those for a couple hours. Believe it or not, in a Instapot, I can cook a batch of dried beans in 36 minutes. Uh, I just saw somebody's shock right now. It's, it's a game changer. You don't have to pre-soak them. You just throw them in the Instapot with enough liquid, flavor them. 36 minutes later, you have a batch of freshly cooked beans, frijoles de la olla. Let me grab a spoon here. And what I use to flavor these frijoles de la olla, hopefully I'm not steaming up my laptop too much here. There we go. Is I use pinto beans, obviously, uh, in this dish. I also threw in my chipotle. Ooh, the stem just came right off. Perfect. So I have a chipotle meco in here. It's a dried brown chile, different than a, ch a chipotle morita. The chipotle morita is more of like this burgundy, smaller chile. These are longer and more of this brown, almost like dry looking chile. And then I also did throw in, like I mentioned earlier, the dried mushrooms that I also picked up at surface. And that gives another flavor component to this dish. I like to always throw in a couple of bay leaves into any beans that I'm cooking. And then of course, salt and pepper. If you have dried avocado leaves on hand, that's another really delicious element that you can add to your beans as they're cooking. So what I need to do here is I need to measure out and throw in my blender two cups of the cooked beans, just pretty much straining out as much of the liquid as I can. And then another two and a half to three cups of this juice, essentially, that they cooked in. If you're using canned beans, you can drain the beans out. And then you could, I mean, if you like to use the liquid in the can and they're organic and it's not too many ingredients, you can, you can do that if you want to. Um, I would drain that out, rinse it, and then add vegetable broth. Um, so you can absolutely do it that way too. Let me turn off my tofu here. I can see that I have a nice browning here on my tofu. Check that out. So if this was mixed in with the mushroom and tempeh mixture, I would definitely not get this much amount of browning happening. It, it's one of these things that it needs to have its own space to cook. So I'm going to go ahead and toss that into my back pan here with the tempeh and mushrooms. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the heat at this point. It's all pretty cooked through. <clears throat> And I'm just gonna mix it together. I'm gonna taste for salt. And I am going to just let this hang out as we get the other elements of our dish ready. Okay, so you can see that that's getting nice and well incorporated. If you wanted to keep this cooking a little bit longer, if you feel like, oh, I want mine to feel like it's a little bit more crispy all together, you can keep cooking it. Uh, you know, you can keep it at a really low heat while the rest of the elements are coming together. This is perfectly fine for me here. So I'm going to just give this a little taste. I thought I had a spoon here, let me grab one. Taste for salt. Chorizo should be salty, slightly salty. And that is really good. It definitely has enough salt because I salted the tofu, I salted the sauce, the paste, the chile paste, I salted the mushrooms and tempeh mixture. That is definitely good on salt. I can taste all the elements from the clove to the cinnamon to the chiles. So that is good to go for me. And I'm going to move this stainless steel pan out of the way and I'm gonna bring in here a small pot. I'm gonna turn on that heat to just low, just to let it start kind of warming up. And then I'm gonna grab my blender. I'm actually gonna grab another blender cup. And I am going to blend up my beans here. So again, just measuring out 
two cups of strained beans. I just have a measuring cup here. It's a one cup measure. So I'm just going to pour in one cup at a time. I'm gonna grab some of those mushrooms, blend those up, throw that into the blender. And grab, just make sure that you don't, you're not blending up the bay leaf. So I'm going to throw in the second cup of beans. And then I'll start off with the two and a half cups blend and then see if I need to add the additional half cup. Again, just kind of checking in to see if it needs a, a bit more of that liquid. So here's a cup. Ooh, it had some bits in there. Let me try to get one without all of that. Here we go, two cups. Let me get about another half cup here. I'm gonna eyeball it. <clears throat> there we go. I'm gonna add a touch more that wasn't quite a half cup. And then I'm going to add my chile here. Wow, you can see this mushroom, beautiful. I wonder what kind of mushroom this is, but it's so huge. It looks like a piece of wood that got rehydrated. So good. I'm gonna add my whole chile into this mixture because I like that little bit of uh, chipotle flavor in my frijoles for the frijoladas. And then of course you can taste it for salt and pepper as needed. So let's blend it and then let's taste because this cooked in some salt. So let me blend it up first and see how it all turns out. So let me head back over to my blender. All right, so you wanna blend quite a bit. Sometimes I do this in the pot with a hand blender. You can do that too. I think it comes out so much more luscious and creamy if I do it in the Vitamix. So let me pan down and show you what this is looking like. And then we can see if it needs any more liquid. So you can see it's this nice, really luscious, creamy bean sauce. And this is what you're looking for. Something that will coat the back of your spoon yeah, it's super luscious. That chile is so good in there. It doesn't need any more salt. I'm good to go. So if I notice that this starts to thicken up a little bit too much as I'm uh, in the pot, I can add a little bit more of my bean juice or liquid, cooking liquid, or any more vegetable broth. So I have this pot on my stove that was just preheating ever so I mean these beans are already cooked I'm just pretty much trying to keep it hot so that I can assemble my dish together I'm just going to add a little touch of oil to the bottom of my pot here and it is hot I can see that as I move the oil in the pot it kind of shimmers it easily moves around in the pot and then I'm going to drop in a little bit of my Let's see if it sears, kind of sizzling a little bit. Let me turn that up slightly. <clears throat> yeah, it's slightly bubbling. I'll bring you in a, uh, for a closer look right now. And you can see how luscious and smooth that bean sauce is. Just trying to scrape all of that out of my blender. And you want this to be nice and warm as we're working the dish together. And we're in the home stretch. This is almost done. All right. <clears throat> Let me get that out of the way. 
you can see some of the bubbling here that's happening with my oil. I'm gonna grab my spatula again here and scrape that. Get all the chorizo bits off of it. And use this for this recipe. Let me actually grab a paper towel and wipe this down. All right. So I'm just going to mix that in. That oil is gonna give a nice little bit of fattiness, just a touch to our bean paste. And I just wanna keep it on, on low. You can see it's steaming here, just enough for it to be nice and warm through. Jocelyn, so, we have a question here. Um, so many Mexican sauce recipes call for pouring the sauce into hot oil. What is the purpose of that? You're just kind of um, like pan searing the, the sauce. So like salsas will call for that. Um, sometimes, you know, sauces will call for that. It, it's just another flavor component. You're kind of like getting that nice sizzle sear to your dish. And then you're also adding a little bit of fat to it, which is gonna be, make the dish even more delicious, right? That little bit of oil, that fattiness to it. I'm going to just switch that back to my back burner. I just wanna keep that at temperature. And then my front burner here, I'm now preheating a cast iron comal. You can use that pan that you had. I could have used it, that pan that I had for the tofu mixture. It has quite a few bits in there though. I'm gonna just do this cast iron comal. I'm gonna add some oil to it. And now what I'm gonna do is pan fry my tortillas. So this recipe serves four. It's just gonna be my partner and I today and I'm just gonna plate one dish. So I'll probably just do like two or three tortillas. These are pre-made corn tortillas. Let me talk about the uh, brand that I like to use. It's, they come almost like essentially non-labeled. I may have the label ones in the freezer. I do freeze these, but I like to use this brand called Kernel of Truth Organics. Um, they have the most delicious, perfect organic corn tortillas here in LA. Um, if you're based here in LA, you can pick them up at Grassroots Market in South Pass, at Cookbook Market in Echo Park and Highland Park, as well as Sarah's Market and City Terrace. They just use an organic non-GMO corn. They do blue, blue corn masa tortillas and yellow corn masa and tortillas. They are the best. And I would suggest doing, um, if you have the time, you can absolutely hand press and make tortillas, fresh tortillas hechas a mano. But <laughs> most people are just gonna grab the pre-made tortillas and make our lives a little bit easier because then that's a whole other step that you have to do. So my oil is hot here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add my tortilla and it's sizzling. I'm just gonna add it to my oil. I'm gonna turn down that back burner because I, I want it to stay warm, but I don't want it to be boiling. I'm gonna let this tortilla cook for about 20, 30 seconds or so. And then I'm going to flip it over on the other side, cook it for another 20, 30 seconds. I like to have a plate handy so that I can just start to stack my slightly pan fried tortillas on top of each other. And then once I have all the tortillas ready to go, then we just assemble it together. The other thing I wanna check on right now, since I have a quick second, is my onions. Let me show you how they're looking. So you can see here that they have definitely wilted down slightly. Let me grab a spoon. Actually, I can, I'm not gonna use my tongs because I'm about to use them on this tortilla. Let me grab a spoon. Before I do that, I'm gonna flip the tortilla, get the other side going. So back to the onions for a second. <clears throat> you can see here that the bottom ones are definitely more tender. They're more pliable. The top ones that have been um, hanging out on the surface, not really submerged in the liquid, they still need a little bit more time. I'm just kind of flipping that over, working all the ingredients together. You can taste the juice to see if it needs any more salt. 
you just want that to keep hanging out. Again, this is going to be so much better tomorrow. So that is just hanging out, waiting for us. Let's come back to the stove. So you want to cook this tortilla with the oil just enough for it to become kind of pliable. And that oil, again, is going to provide a little bit of flavor. It's going to help the tortilla hold together. You don't need to cook it until it's crispy. You don't need a tortilla chip here. Just a little bit to cook it through. Sometimes if the oil puddles in a certain area, I like to kind of drag the oil in with the tortilla towards the center or my heat point. Cook it for about a 30 second point. And then I will flip it over. I'm actually gonna flip it over now. Again, grab a little bit of that oil, make sure it's getting that nice pan searing happening. I see lots of bubbling happening. And then what I'm going to do, I'm gonna do these two and let's start plating because we are just about at time. And I wanna make sure that you see how the finished dish comes together. So I have a plate here that I'll have handy. All right, so I'm gonna remove this stuff. Yeah, let me lower this front burner. If you wanted to remove some of that oil, you can absolutely you know, pat them down on a paper towel or a towel if you'd like to. So let's, let me bring the, camera closer to my back burner here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to essentially dunk my tortilla in this mixture. So I like to place it into the pot. You can see it there to get one side and then I'm gonna flip it over and get the other side. And then I'm going to fold it in half in here and then I'm gonna reach out and place it onto my plate. So I like to just fold them in half this way. Of course you can, you know, some dishes call for it to be folded in a, into a quarter shape. You could absolutely do that if you like. Again, I'm going to dip in the tortilla into my really luscious creamy bean sauce here, flip it over, make sure it's coated nicely fold it in half and then use my tongs to fish it out and place it on top. So I kind of stagger them over each other. You can absolutely add a little bit more of this bean sauce to your dish if you'd like. I'm gonna bring it back to my front camera here and I'm going to grab a spoon so you can see what this is looking like so far super yummy and delicious. I'm gonna grab a spoon and spoon on some of this chorizo that we just made right at the center. There we go. And then of course, we're going to spoon over some of our onion slices, our lemon pickled, the lemon cured onion slices. right over the top there and go ahead and just use my hands. And then for garnish, I do have a little bowl of previously, I, I toasted these beforehand. I like to have a batch of already toasted pepitas and pistachios on hand, just so that if I'm, it's not another thing I have to cook if I'm already cooking so many things. And I cook them in batches and I just have them ready to go for me. You can place them in your fridge. They'll last so much longer if you do, you can use them to garnish your dish. I'll just sprinkle this on, why not? I like the crunch element here that it provides to the dish. And then I'm gonna grab some cilantro out of my fridge and just use the leaves of the cilantro to just add another color component. So let me go ahead and grab that and I'll open it up to any last questions that folks might have about this dish. There we go. I like to pick the leaves off of my cilantro versus mincing it up and just place them around the dish. I think it looks so much more beautiful. So there is the final dish. You can see there. 
And of course you can add more to this if you'd like. Um, you know, it's really hard to stuff these. So, you know, for enchiladas, like you roll them, it's such a difficult process to roll enchiladas, um, but you can absolutely add more things to it if you'd like. But I like the being able to see the essentially what the filling might be on top, right? So the chorizo, instead of being stuffed inside, it's beautifully decorative on top of the dish. I'm gonna give it a bite. Get a bite out of this, there we go. Get a little bit of this chorizo, a little bit of the onion, a pepita, and then a bit of cilantro, there we go. So the perfect bite, a little bit of everything. Salud, everyone. The chipotle in the beans is so delicious, but definitely it stands out. The chorizo is so good. It has a little spicy kick to it, but it's pretty mellow and it provides a really nice texture to the dish. I would still let the onion hang out in that liquid or heat it, like I mentioned, that's the shortcut. If you wanna heat it just enough to really mellow out the onions and then uh, you can put it on a really low temperature, not enough to like cook it through, but enough to just kind of say, hey, <laughs> Let's bring it down a notch onions, or you can throw it in your microwave if you have a microwave. So I see a question coming through. Let's see. Can you overcook the chorizo mixture and still be okay? Yeah, I mean, I would give it a taste and see how it's feeling. Um, if it feels a little dried out, you can uh, potentially add a touch more oil to it or a tiny little bit of that, uh, the rehydrating chile liquid, the water that you use to rehydrate the chiles, you can add a touch of that to kind of um, add an element of moisture back into it. But unless it's, it's burnt, um, I would say still give it a shot and see how it tastes and feels in the dish. I mean, it's possible to overcook anything, right? Or to burn and overcook anything. Any other questions? I'm gonna take one more bite. Great question. You can absolutely make the chorizo in advance. I like to have the chorizo, sometimes when I make it, I just have it in the fridge. And then, you know, life is busy. You can easily make tacos of chorizo. You can do like a vegan just egg with the chorizo and make tacos or whatever. So you can have it readily available for you. You could also have the beans already done too. So this may seem like a lot to do all at once right now, um, but I probably cook a pot of beans like every other week or so now. Um, so that like, you know, that week that I cook them, we're eating a lot of like beans in different ways. Um, and then I'll have a week where like we don't cook eat a lot of beans um but when I do cook the beans it's like I cook a pot of it and I have a batch ready to go the onions like I said you can have the onions in the fridge for a couple weeks a month and it's going to be even better and better so you don't have to make all of this at once this is you know something that will come together so easily if you already have some things that you can just kind of pull out of your fridge. And if you didn't have the chorizo done, but say you have some veggies that you can just saute, like you might have some broccoli that you can spice up and um, pan sear, and then you do them frijoladas, and you have some broccoli on top or some, um, I've done it with like um, sauteed greens, like collard greens, kale. I've done it with tofu. Like I just have tofu and I don't have time to do a whole chorizo. So I'll just crumble the tofu, I'll season it really nicely and then just pan sear it and I'll crumble the tofu or, or layer it just like we did the chorizo. I've done that. So it doesn't have to be exactly this, but it's so good together. Um, but you can absolutely kind of mix and match and make it whatever you have in your fridge. Great. 
All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining me in my kitchen today, especially for folks who are clicking along. I know we did quite a few things, so hopefully you're doing okay in there <laughs> um, and everything looks good and is cooking nicely. If you have any questions, even after this class, please feel free to reach out, email us, DM us, send us a picture of your final product, of your final dish. We'd love to see it. So thank you all so much. Hopefully see you in another cooking class soon.